Ram said, chair, Ram sit down, get you on his news of the mid air and he turned me back while I gave you the latest report. Sport. There never was a finer sight when all our boys were fixed to fight on the You need a chair? I think I'll sit here and dance the time. Right. Oh, okay. Kitty. Yeah. Move her over. Oh, that's a cat. She's, there we go. she's a nice cat. Okay. <clears throat> all right, so. How old were you when you went to war? Uh, I went in on uh, December the 1st, 1942, and I was 19 when I went in service. Right. And I joined the Army in Louisville, Kentucky, right. which was my home at the time. Right. Were you in the States for a while before you went well, overseas? Well, uh, what happened was, uh, <clears throat> after I joined the Army, I had an older brother that's 10 years older than me, 10, and he said, if he can join, I can join. So he went and joined with me. Oh, wow. And he was 10 years older and had a wife and a kid. I was surprised they took him. But the reason they took him was because he was a very experienced baker. Mm. You know, he liked skills. Mm. And uh, so that night we were on a train heading for Indianapolis with Fort Harrison, Indiana. And it was snow on the ground. It was real cold. I remember that. And about four days later after we were at Fort Harrison, my brother Paul got shipped out. Of course, I didn't know where he where he went. You know, they don't tell you that. I didn't have any idea where he went. <clears throat> and then about a few days later, they had me on a train going to Camp Wheeler, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And I got I went and got uh, 13 weeks of infantry training in Camp Wheeler, Georgia. And uh, and then later I learned that Paul had gone to Camp Eight Air, Oregon. And he became a baker for the officers there, you know. He was in the military, of course, he was a soldier. Yeah. And uh, They got to eat. And he, <laughs> he was with the 104th Divi Infantry Division. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually, they went overseas after D-Day. They, did, they didn't hit D-Day. Mm. and uh, But he didn't go with them because I think he was too old or... Well, he was a baker, and they just they, they sent him down to Florence, Arizona, where there was a big prisoner of war camp for German prisoners, mm -hmm. and that's only 40, 50 miles from here. Oh, wow. And, uh, and, that, and that's where he served out the rest of his term. He never went overseas. But so that, is, is that when they were Nazis? Well, they were is, German prisoners of yeah, war. Yeah, yeah. some so, of them were Nazis. So, okay. I guess you couldn't say every German soldier was a Nazi. Okay. Were, a lot of them were just serving their country. They were drafted like we mm. were, yeah. some of them, you know. Yeah. So, and, um, at that time when you enlisted, the Nazis were a huge problem in Germany. Oh, yeah. Well, the Nazis were in Germany. Hitler was, a, was yeah. the chief Nazi. Yeah. yeah. They ran Germany. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, then, and he had his, his own special troops that enforced their will on all of the others, mm -hmm. you know. <clears throat> Where'd you go uh, when you did go overseas? Well, after the... after I got through with my basic training around the end of March, they sent me up to uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, it's It later became Camp Reynolds. At that time, it was a brand new camp, and uh, it was um, right by, it was about halfway between Cleveland and Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And I was up there, and it was a replacement depot, and they just kind of held you there for a while. Where they, so they were deciding where they were going to send you. Mm -hmm. And we all knew it was going to be overseas somewhere. Yeah. <clears throat> so I was there for about a month, and then uh, when I was there, I was fortunate enough to get a three-day three pass to go home and visit my parents. I wasn't married then. I, oh, wow. You know. So I, I did get a three-day pass, and I took a train to Louisville. Oh. And I was there maybe a day or so, and then, you know, traveling time. Yeah. And then when I got back, shortly thereafter, <clears throat> I got shipped to Camp Henry, Indiana, uh, Virginia. Mm -hmm. Camp, Hen uh, Camp, Virginia, uh, Camp Henry, Virginia was right by Newport News there, mm -hmm. and which is a big place where they send troops overseas from. Okay. So first thing I knew, then I was boarding a troop ship, and mm -hmm. we're in a huge convoy, mm -hmm. and uh, we didn't know where we were going. We had both winter clothing and summer clothing <laughs> yeah. that we carried. Ready to go. Yeah, ready to go. And 
later I learned that they did that so that uh, they would make you transport to a lot of clothing, you mm -hmm. know. But we all thought we were going to Australia. And we got out to sea about two or three days and they handed out books and it said, so you're going to North Africa. <laughs> so it took 15 days and we got to North Africa. And on the way over, we got, we had submarines prowling around us and I was watching, I was on deck one day and I was watching our guys, our destroyers going up and down and then uh, they, were, uh, they, they were shooting depth charges out there so I don't know if they ever got that submarine or submarines, whatever it yeah. was, but they didn't get us. Yeah. And we were on the outside of this huge convoy, mm -hmm. and I don't know how many ships in that convoy. I always tried to find a record to find out if I could what convoy I was in, but I never been able to do it. Never yeah. been able to find that out. But anyway, 15 days later, we arrived in North Africa in Oran, <clears throat> and the 1st Infantry Division had just come back from from uh, fighting in, in uh, Tunisia and in, uh, in, uh, in Eastern North Africa. And they, <clears throat> they defeated Rommel's troops mm -hmm. and we captured over 100,000 German troops there and they, their Germans, the others got away and got back to Europe somewhere mm -hmm. or other. They were, they were retreating. And, <clears throat> and so when they came back, when I got over there, the first division was just coming back to Iran in that area, and they they were camped there, <clears throat> and they assigned me to the first division as a replacement. And uh, one day, shortly thereafter, the officers were coming up and down, and I was an infantryman. I got my training in, as a rifleman, and uh, I would have been a poor rifleman. I was wasn't a very good shot. I made marksman. That's about it. <laughs> you know, yeah. I wasn't sharpshooter or expert yeah. anything like that. And uh, and they were uh, asking, they were trying to get volunteers for guys to be a medic. Mm -hmm. So I thought that sounded pretty good. So I raised my hand and they picked me. And then I started getting a medical training at mostly just first aid. Because like I say, the main job that we had was to try to stop bleeding because we're right there when the guy gets wounded, you know. Yeah. And we didn't have any hospitals there. Yeah. You, you Sometimes had, you only had a hospital ship off the coast if you could get the troops back to it. Yeah. So, so anyway. So when uh, when somebody did get wounded, was it how fast were you able to um, transport? Well, if I was them? right there, I was able to do what I could for them. Mm -hmm. And know? then how long would they stay there until they can get? Still, uh, litter bears picked them up. And yeah. And that depended. They yeah. depended. Sometimes. Sometimes maybe some of them didn't get back. They died. They died yeah. because they were they were in shock as well as being. Yeah. But I at least stopped the bleeding. Yeah. Because you're gonna bleed to death. Yeah. They don't stop the bleeding. And then, but they were terribly. It depends on the severity of the wound. Yeah. Uh, one of my first uh, uh, casualties was a tanker, and he was burned by about fifty percent of his body. I don't know. I don't think he survived, but I did what I could for him, and I gave him morphine to ease the pain as much as I could. But that poor guy, I don't. I and I had to leave. See, I couldn't stick around and watch. I had to treat him and move on because yeah. there's other guys that made me need me. Yeah. So. So. So uh, a lot of those people that I treated, I don't ever know what happened to them. Yeah. You know. So when you you got in North North Africa, um, in the Tunisia, the. Where did you go from? I wasn't in Tunisia there. First oh. division, that's where they had been fighting, and they okay. came back, and they won that battle, mm -hmm. and then uh, won that war, mm -hmm. so to speak, and then they came back, and then they were getting ready for another invasion, and we thought we were going to invade Crete, which is off of the coast of Greece, I think, but it turned out we were going to invade Italy, uh, Sicily, which mm -hmm. is off the coast of Italy. Yeah, and. Six weeks later, after I joined and became a medic, so I'd had very little medical training, wow. uh, but it was mostly first aid anyway. Yeah. And uh, I was on the invasion of Sicily. Yeah. And Sicily was kind of a, it was kind of a piece of cake, really. At least I thought the first day, we just waded in. It was about dawn, and, and we were all wet and cold. But other than that, <laughs> we landed in a. Uh, watermelon patch and all the guys were breaking open these watermelons to see if they were good to eat. I yeah. that. And I thought, 
Well, this is my introduction to combat. If this is combat, it's a piece of cake. Yeah. We heard no resistance army. The next day, all heck bro broke loose. The German, about 20 tanks, got behind our lines, and they were trying to drive us off the beach. Uh -huh. And they were playing havoc. Man, I was under an artillery barrage. I never was so scared in all my life. Yeah. And uh, to make a longer story short, the... Um, Navy started firing 16-inch shells at these tanks, and that broke it up. Yeah. But it was a long day, believe me. Yeah. And then I remember, I remember walking down, uh, marching down the road with some buddies, as we were going inland, mm -hmm. and there were ditches on both sides, and just out of us in a split second, one of these ME 109 German fighter planes scooped down on us. Yeah. And he came so low, and he was strafing. Machine gun bullets were coming out on him, you can't believe. Fortunately, we got jumped in the ditch, and nobody got hurt. Wow. But uh, it, it happened almost like in a second, because you know, they're prying pretty fast. Yeah. He just come down there, and he was just strafing everything on that road. And <clears throat> and I and he was so low, I actually could see the pilot. I saw the pilot. Hmm. And for a split second. Yeah, of course. And then a little bit later, we're showing down the same road, and here comes one of the German tanks coming down the road, and he's 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 spraying all over with mm -hmm. machine gun fire, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we had one guy in our uh, with us that had a bazooka, oh. and they would told him don't don't you fire at him, we didn't want that tank coming back. Yeah, he fired anyway, <laughs> and then it it just it just bounced off his track and didn't knock him out. It didn't do anything. Did he come back? No, uh, thank goodness Ooh. he didn't come back. We jumped in the ditch. Yeah, yeah he could have, man, he could have. Yeah. He just wanted to fire the bazooka. We didn't want him back, no. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and anyway, then we went all through Sicily, and it was kind of a, it was it was a lot of artillery fire there, and a lot of uh, a lot of close calls. I was a, uh, I was uh, dug in with a with a close to a guy about no more than ten feet away, in a, in our. One of these ME uh, 88 shells hit right in between us, and it lifted him up, and he had concussion. Mm -hmm. It didn't bother me. It, well, it did shake me up, but I mean, it didn't. I didn't. He had blood coming out of his mm -hmm. ears. You were still okay. To... I was okay. Yeah. 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 And uh, I guess he got. I, I don't think it killed him. I think he probably recovered. Yeah. But I don't remember because I had to move on. Yeah. And you're always moving it, as much as you can. Unless once in a while you might stay in place one or two days. It depends. Yeah. How depends. long? How long were you in Sicily? Well, that lasted about. Uh, we we hit Sicily on July the tenth, nineteen forty three, and uh, the war was over about August the sixth or seventh or eighth, somewhere around there. We wound up fighting the big battle in Torina, which was right by Mount Etna. And the Germans were fighting a delaying action, but as because they wanted to retreat to Italy, they knew that they'd lost Sicily, mm -hmm. and uh, they were just trying to put as many casualties on us as they could, you know, mm -hmm. make it as tough for us as they could. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually, we got relieved on about the thirty-second day of the campaign. That mm -hmm. was just about over then. Mm -hmm. And then other divisions followed those troops into Italy. Other American divisions, mm -hmm. not. But they pulled our division back and put us on trucks, and we went about 160 miles to the south coast. And uh, we stayed there for two or three months, and it was peace, kind of peaceful, you know. Yeah. The war was over there. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we just, we'd, we'd, uh, we'd do a little training in the morning and the afternoon. We could, you know, we could go swimming, or we could play softball, or we could do and what, recreational What, what area was that in? Uh, south part of Sicily. Oh, okay. But the war was over in yeah, Sicily. Yeah. And we didn't know what was in store for us. And there were rumors that they were going to send us back to the States, but nobody believed it. Mm -hmm. And come to find out, uh, in uh, October, they put us on, uh, they loaded us on trucks. Well, we traveled mostly in two and a half ton trucks when there was any distance. And uh, we boarded an English ship. And this English ship was from uh, India, mm -hmm. and on the bottom tier of the ship, they had civilian women and children who were the wives and children of British soldiers who had served in uh, 
in India. Oh, wow. And they were going back to England. That's where we were going. Yeah. So when we found out we were going to England, and then we figured out pretty fast why, because we were going to be preparing for hitting Normandy and, and uh, hitting France. You know? Yeah. And we trained for about, from November till the end of May, we used to pull mock invasions off of, uh, off of England, mm -hmm. you know, practice. Yeah. And uh, so about the end of May, they, they shipped us to this, this uh, camp, and they closed the camp. Nobody could get in or out because they wanted absolute secrecy. Nobody, they didn't want anybody tipping off the Germans. You know, the Germans should have been able to figure out. I'm sure they figured out that we were going to hit somewhere. Yeah. But they thought we were going to hit right across, which is the closest point to England, but we didn't do it that way. Yeah. And Hitler kept a bunch of his troops up there because he thought for sure we were going to hit the closest spot. Mm -hmm. We didn't do that. We hit down in, down like, like this is, like say this is uh, this is England, mm -hmm. this is England, and right across here at the closest point is France, mm -hmm. and then as you go down to France, the border goes out like that, and it goes down like that, and we hit down here. Yeah. So we were maybe I don't know I don't know how many miles or hundreds of miles it was from that other spot where Hitler thought we were, and <clears throat> he held a bunch of his troops up there. If he'd had them where we were, like that. Uh, we probably wouldn't have made it. Yeah, a little strategy to that. Yeah, oh yeah, there was a lot of strategy, and then of course we were pulling, we were pulling fake. Uh, uh, we were we actually had a bunch of fake tanks up there, and they were they were inflatable. Oh wow! Yeah, they were wow. made out of rubber, I guess, and they they were inflatable. They were fake tanks, and so when their their reconnaissance planes would come over, they'd see that and they would think they. would they probably tell Hitler, yeah, they they're amassing there for an attack. Yeah, across. that was just a decoy. Right, and uh, and they also kept Patton up there with them, and because they figured he'd be in on the invasion. Mm -hmm. Well, he he worked as a decoy because mm -hmm. they figured, well, if Patton's there, he certainly that's going to be the leader, you know, and uh, he wasn't on the invasion. Yeah. Patton wasn't. So, so anyway, then. Uh, then on uh, early June, 1944, we uh, loaded up on ships, and I mean, just as far as the eye could see, it turned out there were 5,000 ships wow. involved in that invasion. And I was on the, uh, I think I was on the Samuel P. Chase. I've seen pictures of it on my phone. And uh, we, uh, we left the coast of England uh, late one afternoon, and. About 12 hours later, we were we were about maybe 12 miles or 12 to 15 miles off the coast of Normandy mm -hmm. in the big ship. Mm -hmm. And then the next morning, we we started uh, getting off of the big ship and going down the ladders. You've seen the ladders? Mm -hmm. Well, it was real rough that day. Oh man, the sea wind and, and that little boat we were getting in, uh, a landing craft. It was bobbing and weaving, and the guys, the guys that were in the boat, were holding, trying to hold the net so it wasn't going back and forth. Yeah. And uh, we heard later that some guys on some other ships coming down that ladder uh, lost their footing and drowned. Oh wow! So it was rough. It, but uh, but I got down the ladder, and uh, everybody had got in my boat. I think got down the ladder, and uh, but you could also get hurt if they couldn't hold that. That wind was blowing. And and that and that, if you're on that ladder and it slaps against the boat, you could get hurt. You know? Yeah. But we made it down anyway. Yeah. And then, about fifteen minutes later, twenty minutes later, after we're out on the boat, <laughs> guys started getting. We were packed about fifty in that boat. Guys started getting sick and throwing up over each other. Fortunately, I didn't get seasick, and yeah. I don't remember anybody throwing up. I don't yeah. remember it. I guess I would, but yeah. it was so miserable because you were soaking wet that you know yeah. the water is going to be pouring in that ice cold yeah. water from the yeah. from the bay there, and uh, so anyway, we after we got in that boat and some guys were so sick they said I don't care what's on the beach, just get me on the beach. It's anything's better than this, <laughs> hmm. and we didn't know what was going on, but we figured it must not be going bad or they wouldn't be sending us. 
No. Did you now at this point? Did you expect there to be as big of a battle as there was? I, 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 I the thought ran through my mind of how easy it was in Sicily, mm -hmm. and I said, I know it's not going to be that way. Yeah. But I don't know how bad it's going to be. It depends yeah. whether or not our. See, I was on the third wave. I wasn't on the first wave mm -hmm. or second wave. I was yeah. on the third wave. So we already had some troops that had been there. Yeah. Had, had been there, and we thought, well. If they hadn't been able to successfully land, they would turn us around and not send us. But yeah. no, the strategy was just keep pouring people in, pour them in, pour them in. Yeah. And uh, so I was on the third wave, and uh, I got about uh, way, way out, way out before, I don't know, maybe two, 300 yards. I had no idea how far. I've read different accounts. <clears throat> Bullets start rattling off of our boat. They, they, they can shoot that far. Wow. And artillery was shooting out that mm -hmm. way too, mm -hmm. and blowing up boats. If it hit a boat, you know, boo. And uh, unfortunately, our boat didn't get hit, but uh, we got within about seventy-five yards of the beach, and uh, I jumped off, jumped in the beat in the water. I was already ice cold anyway. It's yeah. miserable. And that boat was was a target. And that boat's a target. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's almost better and, to be uh, swimming. And uh, so I jumped off. I jumped off. The, the ramp went down. I jumped off, and then uh, in the water, hit me up in the chest. And I can't swim. But we had this. Uh, we had these uh, fanny. What do they call them? Sally Mays. It's a. It's a. It's a. It's a boat you put around. It's a life preserver. Okay. And you push a button, and it'll inflate it. Yeah. And. Uh, and but then you got all this equipment on you, and that pulled you down under. And I don't know. Uh, I know I got pulled under the water, but somehow or other I was able to get back up. Yeah. I don't. I still don't know how I did that. And I couldn't swim. But even guys that swim, a lot of those guys drown. They got pulled under, and yeah. they and they couldn't get their equipment on yeah. to lighten their load. <clears throat> and then, and then the first thing I was, I was going in, boy, these. You've seen these huge steel barriers they had up there, all yeah. kinds of things that were meant to keep you from landing. Yeah. And uh, a lot of them were mined. In other yeah. words, you touch them and they blow up. Yeah. But uh, it was a bad day anyway. Yeah. It, so, the sea was really rough. Yeah. And then, then <clears throat> I guess we were going in on high tide. I'm not sure. Yeah. Anyway, I I, I touched one of those mine, uh, one of those barriers. Unfortunately, it didn't go off. So I, wow. I don't know, and I guess I read later that some of those that were mines, the mines didn't go off, but some of them they did, and they did. They even blew up boats and hit them. You know? Yeah. And and then there were a lot of boats where the guys, no sooner they stepped out, the ramp came down, they stepped out, and of course the Navy guy he wants to get rid of the load so he can get out of there, you mm -hmm. know. And uh, uh, a lot of those guys they had later learned that up in the up in those hills. Above us, they were on on the top in the mm -hmm. big pillboxes, just looking down, and they had the whole beach covered with fire. They they had everything they had everything zeroed in. Yeah, as soon as someone dropped the gate, they were just firing. Well, the snipers were picking them off, mm -hmm. and and I learned later on they said they had two hundred snipers up there. Wow. And they and they, snipers are probably experts huh? yeah. when it comes to marching ship. Yeah. Somehow or other, I got to the beach. Mm. And I remember, I remember, uh, I remember all the dead stacked up, and guys without heads, and guys without arms, and the the, the sea was pink with blood. A lot of guys got shot before they ever got off the boat, mm -hmm. and uh, and then a lot of them got shot, and and the, their commander told them to wait till the guys get in close. Wait till the guys get in close, and they, you know, and then they. You could get more of them, I guess. And this guy said he, he said he shot so many that he got tired of shooting people. <laughs> this one German after after it was over. Wow. And uh, but we were just like fish in a barrel, really. Yeah. And we had no protection. Yeah. And uh, and then when you got across the beach, might have been I don't know. I, it's hard for me to remember. I can only go. I can read what people say now. <laughs> yeah. Might have been 150 yards or so. There was a. Uh, a little, a little shale uh, thing, maybe that high or something, and uh, it offered a little cover. Mm -hmm. 
and everybody was stacked up against that cover, and you couldn't tell the living from the dead, and as far as you could see, they were stacked like sardines, like cigars stacked up. Yeah, wow. And a lot of them were crying medic, and I was a medic, so I yeah. couldn't stay there. I had to help treat people, yeah. even, even under the fire, you know. Yeah. And uh, so I was probably on the beach. Uh, uh, eventually, <clears throat> my uh, commanding officer, who was a major, and the doctor, he was a doctor, he was head of the detachment. He told his sergeant to round up all his men that he could find because we were all scattered all over the beach treating people. Mm -hmm. And he said, we gotta get off this beach or we're gonna die. And the colonel, the colonel, the regimental colonel, he was, he was running up and down with utter disregard for his own safety. He didn't get on the ground and crawl. He was running up and down and they, they said, get down, Colonel, you're gonna get killed. And he, he said, we gotta get off this beach, we're all gonna die. And he made a rallying call, and somehow or other, they found uh, a path where it was a single foot path. I mean, you could only have one guy going up that path because it was heavily mined. And the engineers had detonated some of the mines, but you could still step on a mine. And then you're going up, up kind of like a hill and then when we got up there and we made it we dug in you know dug out a foxhole and we were more protected from that fire that, that murderous fire on the beach was just devastating mm -hmm. i mean it was just wiping everybody out and we couldn't we couldn't get up to uh, eventually some of our guys got up to uh to where the pillboxes were and and after losing a lot of men, they eventually killed some of the ones in the pillboxes, and that helped to help us to get a foothold anyway. Mm -hmm. you know. But I wasn't part of that. I was on that. I was going up, up the side of the hill there and dug in, and then we, we, we set up an aid station there, and we started bringing all the wounded up there and treating them as best we could. But the problem was we had to get them littered down to the beach and hope the Navy could come in and take them out. Mm -hmm. But the trouble was, a lot of those guys on the beach, even after they were treated, got killed yeah. because the Navy couldn't get in and get them out. Yeah. And but there were a lot that did get did get back to the yeah. hospital ship. You yeah. know, I mean, it it was just a terrible day. Yeah. And uh, and after that, the next day, I, oh, I remember that night the Germans came over. And as far as you could see, you could see these ships out there, our ships, and the Germans came over with just very few airplanes. They didn't have the air power. We had all the air power, but they made sneak attacks at night, mm -hmm. and they started trying to bomb these ships, and it looked like every ship was firing at them. You could see these tracers. Every mm -hmm. fifth bullet's a tracer. Mm -hmm. It looked like a steady stream. Wow. I never saw such a, it was a, it was the noisiest, Noisiest day I ever lived, <laughs> yeah. like the Fourth of July. I never saw Fourth of July like that. Man, that was a, and there was a big, there was a big ship. Uh, that was on the on our beach, one of ours. Yeah. And what I don't know what it, what, what it was a probably an ammunition ship, yeah. and that <laughs> that thing was on the beach and it got hit, and it and that thing exploded all day. But, but man, that thing was blowing up all day, and that night you could see all these explosions coming from that thing. Wow. From hitting the ammunition? Yeah, the ammunition was set off. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because the Germans were still up there. They were they were still killing a lot of people. Yeah. Even, But now I probably got off the beach after about four hours. I was probably on there about four hours. Yeah. That's my best guess. Yeah. I landed about 8 o'clock, and I think we were off there by 12 o'clock. And But we were probably a 1,000 yards from where we landed to get to that, mm -hmm. find that one path. Yeah. Somebody somebody found that one path, I guess some miner, some engineers that had detonated mines. Mm -hmm. must, they were trying to forge a path so we could get off the beach because you're going to die on that beach. And yeah. Sooner or later, you're going to get hit. I don't know. I didn't get hit as it was. Yeah. When I think of being there four hours, you know. Yeah. And uh, and so then uh, then then later on the day we started making progress and knocking out some of these Germans mm. and making it a little bit more tolerable. But it's still they still uh, 
they still were firing on that beach all, 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 uh, as far as I can remember, at least the uh, darkness, I don't remember. Yeah. Because there was so much other stuff going on. Yeah. But we had a kind of a, and then, and then I was dug in up there after I got up, and I was dug in, and we had a guy in our outfit, he was a medic too, but he had been our dental technician. Mm. When we're not fighting, they, they had different jobs, and we had one guy that was mail clerk, and you had other jobs. Yeah. I used to I used to do uh, medical reports when I when I wasn't type them up and everything and figure out numbers mm -hmm. how many were wounded and how many were sick and stuff and the kind of sickness and all that. Yeah, they kept they kept records on that. Yeah, and that was my job. I was a I and I I, I knew how to type a little bit, so that's how I got the job. Mm -hmm. And uh, but once I was in combat, no, I mean, none of that. No, it was all. Yeah. Taking care of wounded, so but I was dug in about probably no more than seven feet away from the, my friend. He was, and I knew it. He used to clean my teeth in England. Yeah, and he was a good guy. And he, the guy was, he was a uh, six foot four, no and way. that was unheard of almost. Yeah, you know, we were little guys mostly yeah. compared to what they are now. Yeah, and uh, and all of a sudden I heard him holler, "Waldo, I'm hit!" And I looked over. I got over there. He uh, he got hit with a, a mortar shell. They, the artillery. See if you have a hill like this. Artillery will go like this, but a mortar will go like this. Mm. Come just if they can if they can just make it come right down on you, and they can hit you in a hole that way. You know? Yeah. But artillery, they couldn't get you with artillery. Mm. So at least we escaped artillery, but. Martyrs are just as bad if he got shrapnel, mm -hmm. and he got hit in the neck, and blood blood was gushing out his neck. Mm -hmm. And make a long story short, he got back to England. He he survived, and about three or four months later, he rejoined our outfit. Oh wow! So his 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 wounded his wound wasn't uh, wasn't a million dollar wound. Used to call it a million dollar wound if you didn't have to come back to work. Yeah. And a lot of guys wanted a million dollar wound, but they didn't yeah. want to be hurt too bad, but they yeah. wanted enough to not have to come back. Yeah. Well, he, he joined us again about four months, and so he still had another seven, eight months of war. Yeah. And he survived the war. Yeah. And he was a real nice guy, I really liked that guy. <clears throat> and uh, and then, uh, then the next day, uh, we started making, our troops started making progress inland, going inland, mm -hmm. and the resistance, a lot of the Germans were captured, and or, and some of those Germans were not Germans, they were the, they were the uh, people that they had enslaved, and they put them in the front lines, like oh, they wow. were Poles, or they were Ukrainians, or whatever. Wow. Know? They, they, they had captured them, or, you know, and they, they made them serve, and, and then they would have Germans behind them if they turned around. They, they turned around, they'd get it. So they wow. had to fight, you know. Of course, they were glad to be captured, but they had to be careful because they get shot by in the back. Yeah, you, yeah, you turn around. Wow. Yeah. So anyway, uh, uh, then eventually, then then we then we got in some big battles in France and Normandy. After that, that was just the beginning, mm -hmm. and that lasted till. We finally got through. We finally got through uh, France, probably late August, maybe something like that. And we went in, and then we were going north into Belgium. Now, the I think it was the Fourth Infantry Division, <coughs> which had landed on a different beach. See, I landed on the worst beach. Omaha Beach was a, was the absolute worst beach. Mm -hmm. They had that better prepared than any Utah beach. They got they had casualties. None of it was a piece of cake, but ours was the worst. And uh, I think we lost mm, three or four thousand that day. Wow. And then then there was part of the 29th division landed with us, and they got all messed up. Nobody landed where they were supposed to. So we had a plan, but nobody landed where they were supposed oh, to. No. Everything was foiled. Yeah. And it was chaos, actually. It was just chaos. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I had a I had a friend uh, that uh, called me 
uh, oh, about six, seven months ago, and he was, he'd was he been in my outfit. I knew him, and uh, he had a brother who used to be my first sergeant in uh, Sicily. Mm -hmm. So I knew both of the brothers. They were brothers, and, and they were both on the beach that day. And uh, the first guy that I saw on the beach that I knew when I got, I, I, I got across the beach to get to where that cover was like everybody else did, mm -hmm. and darn, he was there. Oh, wow. My ex-first sergeant. And this time he had been transferred to the infantry. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had a hole in the side of his leg like that over here. Yeah. Terrible. But he was real calm and he was not talking to him a little bit. I can't remember what I said. That makes a big difference. Oh, yeah. The shock was just, just oh, yeah. the shock could kill you. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, you'll die. You go into shock, you'll die. But uh, <clears throat> I later heard that he got wounded worse. But here's what happened is the brother that called me, I hadn't talked to him since World War II, uh -huh. which was over 70 years. And he, he saw my name and called me. He saw my name on his phone or something. How long ago was this? Huh? Oh, well, it's been about six or seven months ago. Oh, wow. And uh, he's, he's 96 now. He's oh. over 96. And uh, I'll tell you what happened to him. He was a medic, too. Yeah. And he was in charge. He was a sergeant. And he was in, I was only a carpal then. He was a sergeant and he was in charge of uh, several medics. Yeah. And of course, he was doing a lot of the stuff, pulling guys out of the water and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And the first thing he got shot in the arm and he just pulled out a band aid of his and wrapped it up himself. <laughs> he kept going. <laughs> and then he got shot in the shoulder and I don't know, he got shot up and he kept going. <laughs> and he was in the water pulling out guys, trying to pull out a guy. And one of these LCIs came in, didn't see him, and lowered the ramp right on him <laughs> and broke his back in three places. And he survived that. And next day, he woke up in England in a hospital. It might have been two days. Yeah. And this brother, the first sergeant, yeah. he was critically wounded too. He was right next to him. Oh, and probably the reason they were so close together, they had the same name. Yeah. <laughs> they were lighting he, him said, up. he said he couldn't believe that was yeah. his brother. He said he looked terrible. Yeah. He said, I guess I didn't look very good either. But both of those guys, that was the end of the war for them. They were so badly wounded. Yeah. And they were in hospitals for a year or a year and a half. Before, yeah. Recovering. Mm. And then he went back uh, to uh, MIT to study engineering, uh, yeah. electrical engineering, and he and his brother started an electric uh, repair company and they were in that business till they retired. Yeah. And they had about two, 300 people working for them. Oh, wow. And so they they both survived the war and his brother lived to be 95, but his brother was older, so he's, he, he's dead now. Yeah. And he's still living, he's turned 96, and that's amazing story. That must have been amazing to talk to him. Yeah, it was amazing to talk to him. Yeah. And uh, he remembered me, yeah. He said he remembered me. I mean, he had to. He saw he remembered you by name. Yeah, well, I guess that's right. Yeah, I guess that's right. And uh, and then uh, and then after that, well, well, I uh, I was up in Belgium, and we I was in the Battle of the Ardennes forest, where it was very treacherous there because there were all this dense forest and artillery couldn't hit in there very well. Uh, well, they could hit in there, but they they would they would shoot tree burst. So the detonation would go right at the height of the tree, yeah. and all this shrapnel would just come down on you. Oh, wow. So if, if you were in a foxhole, you could get a shower of shrapnel on you. Yeah. And it was treacherous, and it, and it was cold. Oh, it was starting to get cold. And then eventually, uh, we got around December, we got a uh, 1944. We, we were in a rest area close to Liege, Belgium. And we were supposed to, we were supposed to have a couple of weeks off, but nobody believed anything. There's always rumors. And, yeah. you know, and people say, ah, that's not going to happen. We're, they'll have us back up to front. And we got back in Liege about one or two days, maybe, maybe two, I can't remember. I, know, I remember I was going into Liege and uh, with some buddies, and uh, which was away from the front. Mm -hmm. And that night, that's when they attacked, 
started the Battle of the Bulge. The Germans pulled this big attack. Yeah. And that night we were on trucks heading for the front again. There was snow on the ground. It was cold, bitter cold. And I later learned that it was the coldest winter there in 100 years. Oh, wow. It was cold. And then uh, we usually tried to get in a deserted house if we could find one. But if you wanted to get in the basement, you didn't want to be above ground. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> and uh, sometimes we didn't. We'd have to stay outside, you know. And uh, it's cold. It was, it was miserable. And then anyway, then eventually we were in the Battle of the Ball. And, well, I was actually in Battle of Aachen before that, yeah. And uh, we were we took over a big barracks outside of Aachen. And uh, Aachen was the first big German city. And they really fought hard for Aachen because you're fighting on their homeland. That gave them more incentive mm -hmm. to protect their homeland. Yeah. And it was right where that... Uh, where the uh, all of the uh, fortifications were there, well, we we uh, we captured a big barracks. It used to be a German a German troops used to be in there, I guess. And we were not in Aachen, but Aachen was kind of up on a hill, like as I recall. And their artillery could see every move we made. And I don't know why anybody's put us in that building because they would fire. Every day they'd fire shells and they'd go right through that building, but we were in the basement. It was a three-story building. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and one time I had to go out with my with our supply sergeant, and we had to get down to the uh, at the edge of this barracks. We had what we call a motor pool, and it was kind of like a little mm -hmm. covering for the jeep. And I had to go back with him to uh, drive back twenty miles or something to pick up medical supplies and get them back to us. Man, we had to walk behind that building, and then they saw if they saw you move, just one guy, they'd shoot at you. Yeah, they shooting artillery at us, and then, man, we got in that jeep, and we hopped in that jeep, and man, he put that thing in, he went like that, and we got out of there, and we didn't get, we didn't get hit, obviously, but yeah. we could have. Yeah. And then that night, we came back at night, and I think they didn't, I don't remember being fired at when we came back. I don't remember. Yeah. Well, you we were fired at quite anyway. a bit. Huh? Yeah, you were fired at for quite a bit. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. it was. Uh, it was a yeah. uh, man. It was hot, and uh, we were there for over two weeks in that barracks, mm -hmm. and it was uh, it was very treacherous. One day there was a. They brought a truckload of replacements up, and somebody must not have told them that they, that was that the enemy could see everything. Yeah, and they had artillery to shoot at you. And, uh, you know, they might have been five miles away. I don't know. You know, yeah. that artillery can go pretty far. And uh, they brought this truckload of replacements up. Well, no sooner than they pulled up in front in front of the building where our aid station was, the Germans started pouring 88 shells in there. And, man, we were treating wounded and dead all day. Wow. We had to go out there and rush and get them in. You know? Yeah, so you're you're under heavy fire. Oh yeah, now. yeah, oh yeah. You've got it. You 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 can't hardly rescue anybody without being under heavy fire. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. you're on the front line. So that, that so goes. we got them. We we did what we could that day, but it was a treacherous day. Yeah. But somebody should have never ever let that truck come in front like that. They somebody dropped the ball. Yeah, and cost some lives there. Yeah, and uh, it was tough. And then we and then. Uh, that was before the Battle of the Bulge, okay. incidentally. That was in September, and I got a, uh, I got a bronze star for that. I also got a bronze star for uh, D-Day. So I got two bronze stars. And uh, and then uh, then we proceeded to advance through Germany, and uh, like I told you, we wound up in Czechoslovakia, and that was the end of the war. Mm -hmm. So. And then I did get, I did, uh, in, when I was in the Army of Occupation in Bamberg, which is in southern Germany, I did get a three-day pass to Paris, oh, nice. which was nice. nice. Took a train to Paris, and uh, I remember being under the, uh, that big Arc of Triumph, you know, that, yeah. that whatever that is. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I remember France pretty yeah. well. You wanna, got enough of them there. Huh? Would you like to show me some of your medals? What was that? You want to show me some of the medals? Turn the light on, you can see yeah. it better.
the lighting better from yeah. this angle. Now I can explain what they are. Yeah, I like that. Okay, there's a silver, there's a bronze star. Okay. And you see the cluster up there? See that little cluster? Yeah. That means you got another one. They don't give you two bronze stars, they give you a cluster. Okay. And then that's a good conduct medal. Everybody gets that. That's no big deal, really. It, well, it means you were, you didn't cause a lot of trouble. Anybody, <laughs> huh? uh, this is a European, North African European Theater of Operations. That's what I was in. And I got, I got an arrowhead for making invasion. Mm -hmm. Invasions, you can get an arrowhead on there. And then that little silver star means five campaigns. And the bronze stars won campaign, so I was in six campaigns. They don't give you six bronze stars, they have little stars on there. So I got a, a silver and a bronze, nice. which means that's uh, six campaigns I was in, six different battles. Nice. And uh, the battles are, I can tell you what they are. I was in Sicily, I was in uh, Normandy, uh, northern France, uh, the Ardennes. Central Europe and Rhineland. That's that's where the areas of the big battles were. Yeah. And then uh, this one is the victory medal for victory in World War II. It says it on your CD. Yeah. And then this one is the Army of Occupation in Germany. It says Germany on there. Oh, nice. And uh, then this one is the French Legion of Honor, which is awarded by France. And you just recently got that one, correct? I only got that last December. Yeah. Wow. It took me nine months to get it. I had to put paperwork in for it. Yeah. It proved that I was over there and all that. Yeah. And then um, the ribbons. Normally, you don't wear your ribbons. Yeah. You know, you've seen, they, 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 these are the same, these represent the ribbons. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, yeah, the medals. These the medals. represent the medals. Yeah. yeah. And then that's my division insignia. Okay. First Infantry Division. Yeah. Uh, that's my uh, combat medical badge. You have to be in combat and treat people in, in combat to get that. Oh, wow. So that means you're in. And then this is my, these are the actual dog tags that I wore all through the war. See that? That's it's got awesome. my name on there and everything. Wow. My serial number, 1538294. Uh, that picture is this picture here. That is really a good picture. This was, I was out of the service when I took this. Okay. Shortly after I got out, I had I went down to a photographer, and I'm glad I did it now. Yeah, you know, it's good memory. Yeah. And then, uh, and then, uh, each one of these stripes represents six months overseas. Right. Uh, that was my rank. I was a staff sergeant technician. Okay. I think I, oh, and this one is the Presidential Unit Citation. Our unit got awarded the Presidential Unit Citation for Normandy. Oh, wow. I think we got we got another one for another campaign because I got an Oak Leaf Custer on there. I got two of these. I, it's my division. It's my outfit, not me, yeah. exactly, but I was privileged to wear it because yeah. I was in the outfit. Uh, let's see. There's definitely a lot of history behind this right here. Yeah, it is. Oh yeah, there's a history. Grab yourself a chair and sit down and get you up. Gonna hear some news of the military when they turn. Relax while I give you the latest report. Sports.